So good morning and a big welcome to our first AI Transformation Day. My name is Vanya Kalian and I'm an AI change agent at AI Sweden. And I'm Connie Svensson, head of AI Transformation. And today it's not going to be so much focus on the technical aspects of AI, but more on organization, culture and mindset. So what are your expectations on today, Connie? Yeah, first of all, I'm, I'm excited because this is our first AI Transformation Day, but not the last. Uh, this is a very important subject, so we will see this being a recurring event. Um, my expectation is to share um, both insight, but also really practical tips on how to start your AI journey. I think you uh, that are with us today has already started your first maybe proof of concept. Some of you have reached a little bit further, but we really want to accelerate this journey. So we have a full schedule of speakers and use cases and discussions. So looking at the agenda now, um, the first part of this day is uh, divided into three blocks. The first hour, we're focusing on why AI transformation. The second hour, we will be focusing where you are in your AI journey. And the third block, we're focusing on creating concrete business and user value with AI. Mm. In the afternoon, we will be more hands on working together in workshops and have seminars. So very, very much looking forward to uh, today. And the most important thing is you who are listening, we really want you to be active in the discussions. So post your comments and questions in the chat and we'll pick them up in the discussions. And also we have some many questions for you that you can see now. So uh, do we really need another transformation with AI? That's the first question. And then we'll focus on uh, your input on challenges and opportunities with AI. So please answer these questions using this QR code. We will also post the link uh, in the chat. So um, do that and we'll pick that up later. Uh, a technical thing, this is being recorded and we will stream this. We are streaming this also on our YouTube channel. Um, so with that, I'll give the word to you, Connie, for an introduction. Why AI transformation? Thank you, Vanya. So at AI Sweden, uh, we have a mission of really accelerating the adoption of AI in Sweden for the benefits of society and our competitiveness and also for everybody living in Sweden. So uh, we see AI transformation as being a part of that. Because as I started with earlier, I think a lot of, of companies have started their AI um, journeys, but they haven't really reached the full potential of, of AI. So what, is the, what are the challenges why we're not reaching that? Um, we can see, and I, I think everybody heard the big potential of AI. We've seen you know, the double of, of um, BNP growth. We've seen you know, the report from DIG uh, the other year about 140 billion six in, in the public sector and a lot of other great examples of what the potential of AI is. But very few companies has really uh, reached an, an full potential of, of, of that. So what, what is the gap there really? And it's not so much about technology. As Vanya said, we will not spend this day talking a lot about data and, and, and AI models and all that, more about the what are the capabilities an organization need to have in place to succeed with AI? And we see that it's more about the organization, uh, the culture and mindset, but also to get the leadership really to understand the strategic importance of, of, uh, of AI and data. And that really changes the whole setup of your company. And that is what we mean with AI transformation. So uh, when we um need to start looking at AI transformation it's like you know um some of you that are with us today um you might be a little bit more proficient in how you use AI in your organizations but most companies they are just started and if you look at this maturity model that we will be using during the day and some something that we are collaborating with uh Unternehmertum in in Germany and applied AI so this is a model that we will use in all our communication at AI Sweden. I think it's a great model to really understand what it means to be at the different phases here and what are the challenges. 
Um, so once you've seen this, I think you can maybe plot your own company or organization. See, you know, I think most of you might be an experimenter. Some are practitioners. Maybe some of have you haven't really started yet. So maybe this is your first AI uh, webinar and you're really getting into this. Uh, it's interesting to see. I think most of you think other organization has reached and come further than they really have. But as you see in this picture, uh, it's really most companies that haven't even started their journey. Um, and, and then you, we have a, lot, a bunch of experimenters and practitioners, and those are usually the partners of, of AI Sweden. So where does AI transformation come in uh, into this picture? I would say when you have done your first proof of concepts and you've done a couple of of projects, you really need to start looking at what is the vision of AI for us and how can we make this into systematic implementation in the organization so we can scale this up and really get a greater value out of AI. So I would say uh, somewhere between experimenter and practitioner, and that's where AI transformation becomes more and more important for you to succeed. So it's really about looking at it from a systematic and, and holistic view and, and not just looking at the, you know, the data and, you know, data is the new gold and, and, and just, you know, uh, nerd on, on AI models. Those needs to be there, of course, those are the technical parts, but really look at the whole picture. So all organizations today, they, of course, have some kind of vision and, and objectives. Why do this organization exist in reality? And that is usually then transferred into a business model and a strategy. A business model is how you produce your value and how you deliver that value. And that is true both, both for public and, and private sector. So really looking at what are the different artifacts that we need to have in place to succeed with AI. First, you need to have a good vision of what you want AI to be for you how that supports this vision and objectives of, of the organization, some high level goals, kind of what is the ambition for us with this? What are our principles? What should we do and what should we not do? And also sometimes we need to look at the ethics and sustainability aspects of, of AI as well. And then the main part of this, of course, all the great use cases, how we can use uh, AI to you know, improve our business, to um, uh, increase revenue maybe, deliver better customer service and all these great benefits. This is really where we create the value of AI. And, and there will be a session about this later on today, specifically around this. And this is most companies, they stop at this. Uh, they don't look at the third pillar, which is, I, I would say, the, the stumbling block why um, organization doesn't succeed with AI. It's looking at the capabilities that we need to have in place to realize the vision and the use cases. And if the, these are not in place, these becomes obstacles. And this is where I talk about, you know, organization. Do we have the right competence, the right people? Do we have the right ecosystem uh, and, and so on? But even if all these pieces are in place, we need to have a great way to execute on this. So how do we really drive AI initiatives? How do we build these enablers and how do we communicate the AI vision? So all these things need to be in place, I think, for you to succeed with uh, applied AI and really uh, accelerate there. And we will touch on a lot of these uh, during the day. Finally, uh, I think this around AI enablers is so important, and, and we have divided that into six categories. And again, you can see that we uh, use the model that we do with applied AI in our German friends there. Uh, so most companies, they started with, you know, doing proof of concept. They looked at the data and the technology parts of this. Now you also need to look at, you know, what, how does this affect our processes, our operating model? Do we have a budget and resource to do this? A lot of companies today, they, they treat AI as an ad hoc. They don't really commit resources and budget to do this for real. It's still an experiment, right? And that's why you're on the experimental level. You also need to look at your ecosystem. Do we have the right partnerships? Uh, the partners you have today might not be the right partners for tomorrow. And AI Sweden is, of course, one of those partners that you can join this uh, network. Um, then the competence. Do we have the expertise that are needed? Do we have training in the company to, to raise the awareness and the um, talent in the company? And maybe we need to hire or we bring in consultants. 
I think one of the most important uh, parts of this is the culture question. Uh, we need to have a brave and curious mindset and also a, a leadership that really understand the strategic importance of AI and data. And those are really tough subjects to, to handle. And this will look different in each organization, how to tackle the, the mindset and culture, because we all have different uh, legacies there. So this is really a quick introduction why we need AI transformation, all the different dimensions of it. So we'll go through a lot of these during the day. So thank you so much, Connie, for this uh, introduction. And it's now time for our first main speaker of this block. So I will welcome Ödjad Andersson, uh, the CEO of Sensact. Um, and you have uh, a background from driving change uh, from the telecom industry, the automotive industry, and now also as the CEO of Sensact. And today you will uh, share your learnings and your takeaways from driving change. Yes. So I will give the stage to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and uh, as a as uh, in the introduction here, I'm the CEO of Sensact. And just for, for those of you who don't know us, we're a, a software company that develops software for autonomous driving and for saving lives. Basically also supporting the driver with all that great tech in, in making cars uh, uh, not collide. So our vision is to, to drive zero collision uh, driving in the future, whether the car drives itself or whether we support the driver. So that's that's a, a great starting point, right? We get to go to work and we have a, a life saving mission and we also get to work on the coolest tech around. Um, but today I'm here to talk a little bit about driving change. And as mentioned, I have a, a background uh, uh, in uh, Volvo cars before I, I joined uh, Sunsact and also in, uh, in Ericsson where I've been a part of big transformations. And I've been a part of driving them, but it's also not, a, of course, a one man show to drive change. So, so uh, very many of my colleagues have been, uh, been my good friends and, uh, and uh, collaborators in this uh, change. Uh, and to talk about change, I think it's sometimes good to put it in context. So when I, I do speech, I normally talk about how the automotive industry is changing. And I show this picture a lot. And, and the reason I show it, this is a rather Volvo centric picture. It covers a number of big changes that the automotive industry is going through. Electrification, uh, going from hardware based products to software based products, and, and really everything that that encompasses. Connecting all the products, which means you, you have uh, a lot of new opportunities and it started as kind of a gimmick you could get connection but we're moving towards connection being the normal which gives a lot of good opportunities of course autonomous drive that's very close to my heart uh, it also has meant a few other things uh, consumer behavior means you go online uh, of course the pandemic has accelerated this but this would have happened anyway because all other industries are going online with their sales and that's how you as a consumer expect to to do it and in this big mix of things, uh, there's a need, as Connie mentioned, for totally new partnerships. So when you have like six major change drivers, the traditional approach of trying to plan out the future for a great number of years becomes kind of useless because you have these changes also interplay with each other and nobody can predict exactly how this will play out and exactly uh, how to make the plan. So instead of being planners, we need to be adaptable. And the automotive industry was really, really good at planning. And there is kind of big industries need a lot of planning. There's not that uh, great a margin to the product. So you really need to reduce risk. So the transformation is of course about the technology and about building uh, really quick loops for making software and things like that for hiring a lot of software developers who can uh, who, who can work on the new type of technology but it's as much about transforming the whole way you work and i think that's uh, where we i think the same experience from ericsson you underestimate how how this change impacts every single part of the organization so in the beginning, you start by wondering why doesn't software really work when you try to develop it the, the way you always develop hardware. 
And then you kind of realize that the processes are not really good for software and you start changing in that corner. But it's not just there. It's everywhere from there to, to where you meet your users and, and creating a continuous development of the product means that every single system you have in, in how you take decisions and <clears throat> how you interact with your your uh, ecosystem and how you interact with your users is impacted. So we went through a lot of change in the industry. I mean, this is a journey has really just started. Uh, and then, of course, came AI, as a famous print said, it's all over the place. Uh, and trying to put that a bit in, into context. So, so why is, is this now uh, really interesting to us? If I start an autonomous drive, AI is like a, a huge uh, part of, of really making uh, autonomous drive work. Uh, we have a lot of, of uh, really smart people working on this, starting in the vision area and I think expanding more and more into other areas. But, but from the automotive industry, it's a lot of other places. I mean, it's, uh, it's the whole um, uh, relationship with the user. All of a sudden you go online, you have tons of data on what users actually do. And, and then uh, instead of having uh, thousands of skilled people who predict what users might like in, in different markets, you can all of a sudden use the data, apply AI to that and start really optimizing your offering. Uh, also on the hardware, but uh, of course also on the software that you can, uh, with a more rapid pace, develop. Uh, it, it impacts a lot uh, on, or there's an opportunity, I would say, for AI when you have every car connected. All of a sudden you have a system of systems where you can start kind of thinking about things like edge computing in the car. And I mean, here we're just babies learning to crawl right now, but but there's a lot of opportunity from the connectivity and building a, a bigger system of all the cars that are connected. Uh, and I think if you look at the partnerships, all of a sudden, again, you need other partnerships. Uh, we also get a lot of AI through our new partnerships that uh, with, with other type of companies than used to be in the industry. So now we have another wave of this transformation and it brings a bunch of new questions like, how do we take care of all the data? I mean, it's quite easy if you have uh, competent sensors on a car to collect a uh, gazillion uh, amounts of data, it's also quite expensive to take care of it. So how do we avoid becoming hoarders and, and pick out the, the gold nuggets out of that? How, how, how do we build this loop of using the data and applying AI and uh, certifying that it's really safe when it's not the kind of predicted uh, and, and requirement driven development process. So all of this also impacts across the organization everywhere from the really super competent tech uh, guys uh, and uh, ladies who are developing the AI to all the way out to the kind of how we do our sales processes and everything. Uh, and if you look at the car, and I'm nerding in on the tech, I know Connie said we shouldn't do that, but uh, I'm, I do it anyway. Uh, what, what, what we built, I think, also impacts tech becomes the driver of the business and, and the other way around, the business drives the tech. But in, in the car, just as an example, we, we applied uh, a new set of sensors that will come out with the next generation of cars, regardless of, of uh, brand, I would say you're moving in this direction. Instead of having 150 plus computers in a car that do one thing each, we, uh, as a consequence of advanced tech like, uh, like autonomous drive, we had to kind of uh, change the whole architecture and separate sensors and hardware a bit from, from the software and compute. And that's a, a really good thing in itself because it was really becoming unsustainable to, to manage a network of, of uh, that many computers. It wasn't adapted for continuous growth of value, but this also gives a lot of other opportunities. Now we have super competent sensors giving us a lot of information. We specified them and put them there because we need them for autonomous drive and advanced uh, driver safety things. But we now have uh, a, a supercomputer uh, as a brain in the middle of the car. And this is a new opportunity. This is a, a platform where you can actually use that sensor data and that ability to compute and start innovating other functions. 
and we're quite passionate about building this as a, a an ecosystem around us because we realize that with our resources we can't do everything and we will be very focused on the autonomous drive and safety but we can build this platform and all of a sudden in the past you used to need to have a factory produce the hardware deliver the whole uh, the whole computer be automotive certified now all of a sudden there is a computer there is access to sensor data if we publish it in the right way and you can actually start to innovate on that so that's an upside in this transformation uh, i was asked a little bit about learnings from the transformation and i think the first one is it's a bit overwhelming. I mean, first we had this massive transformation towards uh, towards uh, software, and then the second wave. Uh, now we need to to do it again for for adapting to being a good AI uh, company. I, I think it's very easy to be overwhelmed, but there's no need to be overwhelmed. I mean, you start in one corner where you see a lot of potential, and you get momentum, and you get people who are wanting to make uh, the change to happen and, and you start there just as when we did the software transformation we started with the software people who weren't really uh, working in a, a, an efficient way they wanted a new way to do things and from there we realized we needed to change a lot of things in, in many places i think we also uh, learn and i learn every day that i mean it's continuous uh, knowledge from data. It's technically data, of course, uh, and we're talking about AI here, but it's also using data all the time to update how we do things and to change the transformation. You can't start a thing that changes more or less every part of a company and think you will think it out uh, before you start and then just apply the plan. So you need to kind of look at the data, use it, change, adapt, uh, try again, and this is true for the product and it's very much true for the organizational change. There's a pitfall here though. If you start looking at data of things that used to be when you make a massive transformation, you may see things that, uh, that uh, don't take you in the direction you would like to go. For instance, if you take electrification, if you haven't ever sold an electric car and you start looking at the data, the, the conclusion would be that 100% of the people like to buy combustion engines. That's not necessarily true. So using the data in a wise way is also um, an important thing. The, the last thing I think we learned is that it's, it's tricky to make the right strategy, but it's like 10% of the work. The other 90% is hard work and actually needs a lot of attention. You need to actively drive the change and have change management in place. We need to align, to train together, to, to put thousands of people through training. If you want people to behave differently tomorrow than today, we need to talk about it and we need to actively drive that change. All right, uh, as I said, we have new possibilities. So from our perspective, and I think this is just an example from our company, I think it can apply to everybody. Once you start changing a lot of things, you can reassess who can be your partner who do you want to work with? So, I mean, for instance, in the Volvo case, they used to specify a lot of things and then send specifications to a, an automotive supplier. Instead, they started working with Google uh, and uh, using Google systems built into the car gives immediate access to, to systems that you could have never specified from a car company. So find who your big partners can be and, and start exploring those possibilities. And changing the tech always gives new possibilities and changing the ecosystem always gives input to the tech. Uh, in our case, we work a lot with different partners and I think we have two different flavors. One is really technical. We find uh, the, the best partner we, we believe can make us uh, successful. And in our case, we work with uh, companies like Luminar, uh, super competent uh, startup in, in the LiDAR space, giving us uh, the world's best sensing. Uh, we work with NVIDIA because we need the massive compute and, and they are the leaders in that area. We work with, uh, with the Hewlett Packard uh, enterprise to, to uh, take care of our data in a, an efficient way. But we also work with Mobility X Lab to be able to, to uh, find those partners who might be a, a part of our third party ecosystem who are not the huge players. And of course, with AI Sweden, 
uh, exploring all kinds of things, uh, starting with the, the core of our tech uh, and going into things where we're really uh, starting to explore things like edge learning and, and uh, other things there. So you need both the kind of competence partners and, and the real tech partners. All right, a few takeaways before I end. Uh, driving change is important. You need to be super impatient or nothing will happen. And at the same time, you need to be super stubborn. And you need to, to uh, place a few bets on things and really drive those. Try them, get data, learn from the data and repeat again. Try something else, get data and learn, both with regards to how the change works and with regards to the tech and the products. And you dare to partner and you, dare, you need to dare to partner with completely different players than would normally define the truth of your industry or you won't really get the change to happen. So those are some of our learnings. The, the fourth one that I should have put here is it's a lot of fun and sometimes super frustrating. All right. So thank you so much for that super interesting and really uh, good insights that you have. I uh, will ask you more questions in the panel, but I have a super quick one. Yeah. Um, and you are mentioning people. Uh, so when it comes to mindset, have, how have you worked with mindset in, in practice? Hmm. I mean, we have actually worked a lot with that and talked a lot about things like, you know, the change curve, we put ropes on the floor and went to stand where, I mean, uh, representing where we feel like we are in the change. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about moving from a predictable world to where everything is changing. You need to kind of accept that the change is the new normal. It's not like we're going to change once and then everything will be stable. Mm -hmm. The stability is gone and the change is the normal. And you need to learn how to like to be in that mm -hmm. mode. But I think it's talking, 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 and then trying to meet people where they are. Some are already running and others are really hesitating and you need to kind of adapt to that. Yeah. So thank you. And I think many who are listening are also will take a lot of uh, things with uh, them uh, from your presentation today and also with uh, the people in mind and mindset in mind. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you so much for that. And we will now move on to our first transformation case. So I will um, introduce Isaiah from Riksbanken and Joseph from Modelai, and you will share your insights that you got from uh, with the help of AI in your transformation case. So I'll give the word to you. Great, thanks. Thanks. So should we share the slides? Um, right. I'll leave over to you as I. All right. So this will be a two part presentation. So I'm going to start by describing the specific, a specific instance of AI transformation at the Ricks Bank. And then Joseph will end the presentation by describing the role that Moduli played in facilitating part of that transformation. And you can go to the next slide. So in our case, the transformation could probably be accurately described as a data collection transformation that involved machine learning. Uh, and, it, and it was in some sense forced by the COVID-19 outbreak. So it was clear in March of last year that COVID was going to have a substantial impact on the economy. And it was also clear that the, the standard monitoring tools that we had access to, including official statistics, were too low frequency uh, to allow us to monitor the impact as it unfolded. So COVID, uh, you know, the change in, in the, the caseload of COVID, um, you know, changes in that were meaningful on a daily and weekly timescale, whereas official statistics are available at monthly and quarterly frequencies with a lag. So, you know, it was clear from, from official statistics alone that we weren't going to be able to get an accurate picture of the current underlying state of the economy. Now, our chief data officer at the Ricks Bank uh, recognized this early on and put together uh, a team across divisions to do real-time monitoring of the economy. And in addition to this effort, we put together an experimental project, which was intended to widen access and participation to the monitoring process. Uh, and so what we did is developed a web application that allowed members of the, the public in general to uh, contribute to the project. Uh, so this included private companies uh, and academics. 
And our intention was to create a truly national effort where anyone who had the capacity and willingness to contribute to this project to monitor the economy at a high frequency uh, during a pandemic uh, had a channel through which they could do that. Now, part of the reason why we thought that this would be a, help, a helpful complement to our internal project is that data is distributed across the private sector. Uh, you know, in some cases, no one knows that someone is holding data other than that person. Uh, and also skills are not all, you know, all the skills that we needed are not necessarily located at the central bank. So in particular, skills in machine learning are overwhelmingly concentrated in the private sector and academia. So this project made it possible for us to include data and skills that, you know, that we wouldn't normally have access to at the central bank. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Now, we're quite fortunate in that we had uh, a number of private sector participants who joined us in an early closed beta, including Price Runner, Book of Board, Palterion, and Moduli. So Price Runner uh, took their large uh, price comparison database and put together daily retail price and volume indices for 14 retail categories, which was really unheard of uh, at, at the time uh, in terms of what this allowed us to, to monitor. And Book of Board gave us insight into a particular vulnerable industry, the restaurant industry. Uh, and then we had two wonderful NLP projects from Palterion and Moduli, and I'll turn it over to Joseph to talk about what Moduli did. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so in order for, for Riksbanken to get real-time signal on the economy, we decided to look at press releases from public companies. Uh, and a lot of what's happening in the economy is sort of distilled into the press releases on the public market. So a lot of companies, if they change their outlook, they will put out the press releases telling that, okay, earnings are expected to go down because of the pandemic, for example. And uh, an analyst cannot sit down and read all these press releases. So this is where the NLP comes in, to the rescue. And this case is basically uh, perfect for using state-of-the-art natural language processing models out there, where basically you can just take press release and extract the information, the, the topic or the semantics of that press release to say, is the company affected by the pandemic in a negative or positive way? Uh, so this does not re require like detailed understanding of a very specific press release, but you can do average on the whole to say that in general, press releases have a more negative outlook of the economy, which is something that off the shelf commodity natural language processing is doing very well right now. So this is what we were, uh, this is what we were building for Rick in this case. Um, and just as a transformation case, this is, this is a very good, good one because you can use off the shelf technology here and get something up and running very fast. So we started meeting Rick's Banking in April, 2020. Uh, this sort of had the project scope set in May, did all the modeling in June and had the solution up and running in July with, with, uh, with Amazon and, and cloud technologies and the models and everything like that to produce, produce the signals that, that Rick's Banking needed and had it integrated with their web app that I just told. So, and the success factor here is basically a very clear project scope. Uh, the technology is already out there. It was a couple of, maybe a thousand lines of Python in the end to get it up and running and, and uh, creating value uh, in a, with limited risk. That is basically the, the case that we did for them. Yeah, that's um, what we had to say. Thank you so much for that, uh, Joseph and Asaya. And you will stay on for the panel that we will move on to now. And I will also welcome Connie back and Adia back to the panel as well. Um, and um, the first thing we will do in the panel is to look at your answers on the Menti questions. So, um, so um, Let's have a look at the first uh, question and your answers on that. And the first question we had was if we really need another transformation. Yes. And looking uh, at your answers, most of you, yes, this will affect everything. And we are 
so happy that you say that. Uh, what are your uh, reflections, Connie? Yeah, uh, no, it, it definitely will. And I, I looked at the uh, Q and A's as well, uh, and we see, you know, what happens with the other industries that the, you know, automotive industry will change. So, so it, it has a ripple effect on everything. So it really does change everything. But also, I want to uh, comment on the. Uh, there are people that thinks you know this is part of the digital transformation, and, and yes, but I think this has a, a bigger scope uh, that, than what we looked at the earlier phase of digital transformation. So maybe it is an expansion of digital transformation, if we put it that way. Mm. Uh, and looking at the, at the second question, then, and th now we are focusing on the challenges. What what do you see as the challenges with your AI journey? Mm. And um, it is exciting as it is on the Eurovision, right? Yes. It's like we have a result. <laughs> uh, some. Uh, so maybe start with you, Adrian. Uh, what do you see as the main challenges if we start with that? And I think it's, uh, it's many uh, small challenges and a few big ones. I mean, the first one is you need to build competence around this and really start the uh, the work and its different competence. So it also requires completely different tool sets. But as I, I mentioned a bit before, it also impacts a lot of parts of the organization where people actually had a job to to work on data and predict things, for instance, which may be actually completely changed by this. So you get a lot of working with human uh, behavior in that change situation where you may feel threatened or you may not like what's going on or think it's right or yeah mm. so it, it's a lot of things i say if i pass uh, over to you uh, what are your reflections on Adjad's comment yeah so i guess i can say something um in terms of the the ricks bank and um I'd say in our case, um, you know, the largest asset that we have as a central bank is the public's trust. And so, you know, it, it's quite important that we don't move too fast and do things that uh, the public finds unpredictable. Uh, and so in some sense for us, it's quite difficult to transform quickly for that reason. But it's also important that we make use of technologies that enable us to carry out our mandate as a central bank uh, more effectively. So there's a balancing act there uh, for us in some sense, and I'd say that's the primary challenge. Mm. Uh, Joseph, I'm thinking of the opportunities then to, to look at the positive side. Uh, what are your reflections on the opportunities with the, the organ that you see with the organization you are, organizations you are working with? What opportunities do they see? And what do you tell them are the opportunities? There are so many aspects to this, but, but one thing that I wanted to bring up was basically uh, the difference between use cases that require innovation and use cases that are basically commodities right now. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of what we're seeing is that people think that AI requires innovation in terms of technology, uh, while a lot of the use cases that we see actually out there are commodity use cases that you can, it's well established in the industry how to solve and, and put them into practice. And this requires an organization not to reinvent the wheel in their use cases from the technology and machine learning and AI side. So what, what the challenge is often not in terms of, of the technology and the AI side, but basically what you have already brought up. But it's an important to make this distinction between innovation and commodity use cases. A lot of stuff is off the shelf out there and you don't need to reinvent the wheel in terms of technology when 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 you execute on your AI transformation journey, uh, and as Odgard said, if you if you work with partners that has the expertise, uh, you will win a lot when when you execute here. I think uh, Joseph brings up a really good point of that we you know we don't need to. There are a lot of of um, use cases that are already solved, and really we have off the shelf solutions for it. Uh, just the last couple of years, we've come a long way in AI, actually. So we're at AI Sweden. We're really looking into building this use case library where you can get inspiration of things in your industry or maybe in similar functions in your company. So you don't need to reinvent it 
uh, from, from start everything. So, so there are a lot of things you can learn from, not just in your own industry, but also from other industries. So I think that's an important part of this, that you know, not just look at what others are doing in the same industry here. Hmm. Um, I'm thinking on that first question where we where we saw your answers on the Menti question, and some of you uh, didn't see the difference for, uh, between AI and uh, normal software development. And this makes me think of you, Adyad, in the um, in our podcast mm. uh, AI for CXOs, and you said something like, and this is me translating, um, uh, that AI is not as sophisticated as software development. And I think that was really interesting. Would you like to tell us a bit more on that? I mean, I may be shot down here now in this <laughs> uh, audience. No, but I, what I meant by it is that I may be connecting a little bit to this, that you can actually find a lot of, of things that are already developed. What, what you do is really, in, in one way, replacing really skilled, semi-manual work which software development is and then sometimes quite manual uh, with uh, a method that's much more intense in using compute and other things but there's also a lot of of tech out there that you can actually use you can find models uh, as long as you have the data with brute force you can actually do quite a lot and and there's a sophistication to that as well so maybe i shouldn't call it unsophisticated but but it's a different approach mm. so in, instead of surgically trying to be as good uh, uh, and as skillful as possible developing software there are other things that become important mm. um something you would like to add um... no i i, I think um you we, we touched on that before also you, you mentioned on, on how you worked on um, changing the culture and all that so so really both you know, from the technical side of of things and also from the business side you need to think about these ai initiatives differently i, I guess because you're it, it is not as mature really on how to work with this and really you know fail fast and all this and how have you managed to you know get everybody to understand that this is something differently in, in how we need to work with it also both from the business side and the it side I, I think you have to do it and then look at it i mean yeah. one example that we we did in when i was in volvo cars is we have like a, a, a sales online it's a quite different product than buying a pair of shoes and normally when you buy a car you can configure thousands of different things which ends up in millions of different combinations and we started working with AI to see, can we really find, uh, I mean, it was not a good user experience to have to make a thousand choices or a hundred choices. We know from data that people kind of lose their faith in the middle of the process and we lose people. So we wanted to find through AI, what kind of configurations are really the ones that will sell. And so we started experimenting, but ahead of time, everybody was just saying that just will not work. Mm. And, and I think the only way to do it is to start working on it and then you get some proof points. And, and that case, I don't think we're still fully through, but yeah. you need to kind of work it through and see, does it work for us, given the complexity we have? It's not a pair of shoes, it's a car. It's a much bigger investment. It mm. has a lot of choices. So people need to get comfortable with feeling uncertain because you, the, the outcome is not certain. You have like mm. an hypothesis, an idea that we could maybe do it this way instead and then really live with um, with that notion that uh, we're not sure this is not a typical IT project there, you know, we install this system and we know what we will get on the other end. It's like, yeah, and I think the time is running so quickly now and it's so much to discuss, <laughs> but I think that was actually a quite good uh, final word for this uh, discussion. So we will be back uh, in uh, uh, 15 minutes at 930 and we will then be focusing on your AI journey. So have a little break and see you then.
So welcome back and we will now uh, be focusing on the AI journey and your AI journey. Um, so we have a full agenda for this block as well. Uh, we will first start with the Menti uh, questions. Uh, so here there are, have your organization started the AI journey? Uh, which will be the first focus on, on the introduction. And then uh, related to training, have you taken part in an AI-related AI training? And what level would you like that training to be at? So use the QR code and we'll pick the questions up and uh, uh, we really encourage you to use this. Uh, also post your questions in the chat and we'll pick them up in the panel as well. I will now introduce Raquel. Uh, head of training at AI Sweden and Connie, you met before, head of transformation, and you will um, introduce this block. So I'll give the stage to you. Great, great. Thank you. So we talked about why we uh, need AI transformation and kind of an introduction in the earlier session here. Now we will talk a little bit more about kind of the process of how we work with AI transformation, a little bit more practical here. Um, so in the session before, we introduced these different um, uh, modules or, or, or pillars of uh, artifacts you need to have to be able to uh, really get applied AI in your organization. And in this one part, we will uh, focus on the execution part because I think it's crucial, uh, even if you have all the things in place, if you don't really know how to work with it, uh, it will fall flat, I think. Um, so, in this, we will uh, introduce something we call the Lean AI Transformation. In the afternoon, we have a session uh, that where we do a little bit more uh, deep dive into this, if you're really interested in what, what this is all about. And this is a combination of uh, Lean uh, Startup, also with other uh, transformational uh, methods to really have a systematic way to approach the AI transformation. And we think it always starts with understanding where you are right now. So if you remember that the maturity levels we had, AI transformation starts where you, uh, when you want to take the next step from maybe a experimenter and you really want to have a systematic view of this. So you have already done some uh, first uh, proof of concepts and, and demos. So you start with doing an assessment, and this is really to understand where you are right now. If you're on a journey, you need to know where you are right now to be able to uh, understand where you're going. So the next step after that is really to, you know, dream about what can be done with AI and, and both, you know, in a short term and a long term. And some people are kind of scared with this word dreaming, you know, you know, just being all uh, you know, flying to Mars with Elon Musk and all that. But it's really, of course, understanding how you can do something differently tomorrow from what you do today. Uh, so that is a very important step. And each step here is really uh, different ways and methods inside that, how you reach that. The next one is what we call the plan. So now when we know where we are and kind of what we want to do, then we need to start looking at... Um, a plan on how to set this in motion. And this is also taking in consideration all the AI enablers we talked about earlier. So it's not just about coming up with all these use cases. We need to understand, okay, so what needs to be in place for us to be able to do this? It could be everything from AI platforms to training initiatives that Raquel will talk about a bit later here. And, and uh, you know, do we have the right culture and the partnerships and all that? So really the plan is, is more about making sure you have the right capabilities and then commit to that. Also very important to have the budget, the resources and the time to be able to do this. And then we get to the important part is actually the change. And this is really where, you know, the, you implement your plan. Uh, and, and usually you have some type of um, process to do this if you use SAFE or any other method, but this is not just on the IT side of implementing something. It could be a new business model. So it's, it's also on the organization side, of course, you know, roll out the training and all kind of other uh, uh, initiatives. So, so this really needs to be a, an aligned with all your different processes across the organization. 
Lastly, you want to take this and, and expand and scale this up, right? So this is why it's called Lean AI Transformation. You can start this being really small in one group or team, and this could be very uh, efficient. So this, this looks like a, a, a big process, but it's, it could be really uh, lean in its implementation. Uh, and also important to know is that this is an iterative process, just like Erdiad said earlier here, this is not a process. I like to look at this as a more a model to think about the different um, steps we need to do, because it's so easy to just jump into doing something and not have these enablers in place or, or so. So it's, 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 it's more of a way of thinking. Uh, so then, of course, once you run your project, uh, you will get new input to the dream phase along the way. It could be new regulatory um, things coming out from the market. It could be uh, ideas coming from your innovation process. And then you need to, of course, plan that and get that into the roadmap. And something that needs to run along all this time is something we call the understanding plan to really, you know, um, Usually in, in big pro programs and portfolios, you're talking about the communication plan, what, but re, what you really want to, to reach is an understanding in the organization. Why do we do this? What are we doing right now? And what is the next step? So work with that through the whole process all the time. And then on a maybe a yearly basis or something, really, you know, do a new assessment and see where you are in, um, is, and see if you have kind of reached your goals and, and, and have taken a step on this maturity scale. And I will introduce something today around the assessment phase. Uh, this is an announcement that we are now going to uh, use the uh, AI maturity assessment tool from uh, Unternehmertum. Uh, it's a um, tool that uh, Applied AI has developed. It's a really a structured way to assess your maturity. And it's used today in eight different countries. So with that, it means that we, there are a lot of, of knowledge built into this model. Uh, and you can also use it to kind of benchmark different countries and also industries. It looks in 10 different dimensions. Uh, and six of those are those enablers we talked about earlier. But also, if you have a, a good steering, your ambition, how you execute and your use cases, so it really looks at the whole picture. And I think that's really important. Um, as I said, you can benchmark uh, across industries and, and countries. So this is a really good way to look at, um, see how you compare with your peers, but also, also within the company, you can do this in different groups or business units, for example, to see you know, if you have a different view on certain things, if the business sees it different from, from the technology side or different uh, business areas. Uh, so, as I said earlier, we need to do an assessment also to have a common view of where we are today to be able to go somewhere in the future. And as I said, this we're launching this today and this will be available free for all Swedish organizations during this year. We will start with a couple of uh, pilot organizations and then with our partners, but then we will roll it out to all organizations. So we really want this to be a way for um, Sweden to be able to assess where they are on the AI maturity scale. And, and we can kind of see how Sweden progresses. And that is part of our mission at AI Sweden. Um, so just a quick way at looking at uh, how the assessment kind of output looks once you've done this. Uh, uh, it's a lot of, of different statements and questions that you send out in your organization. You get a kind of a level on where you are in the different uh, dimensions and you can see and use this as a strategic tool where we need to uh, do more work and kind of put the ambition. Where do we want to be in a year or, or two years from this? So even if you want need to work with this iteratively, you also need to put a, a longer plan uh, together with a short plan. And then you can benchmark and see how this compares with your peers in the uh, industry or, or across countries or other dimensions. And as I mentioned, it could be also a great tool to kind of compare how different groups and business units in your organization uh, compare on this scale. So to drive the 
transformation is important to have some kind of change agent uh, role in the organization. And talking about the change agent will be Raquel and about training in more general. Thank you, Connie. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that you, you all agree with me when I say that it's not an easy task to create movement in an AI transformation journey or any sustainable transformation journey for that matter. Um, it requires determination, commitment, knowledge, skill sets, uh, competence, tools, and a lot of courage. All of these ingredients need to exist in an organization in order to be successful with transformation. And, and, and that's why you need a, a lot of help. And, and uh, we at AI Sweden, we have identified uh, the role of the AI change agent, who we see supports and keeps the transformation moving. An AI change agent should have sufficient knowledge about business and processes, data and applied AI, but also people and culture. The ambition of the role is to be the mediator. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the mediator between business, people, and technology, with a focus on accelerating the AI value creation in organizations. Uh, to, to succeed, the role uh, is totally dependent on the support from management, brave leadership, having the mandate and resources. And, uh, and uh, I encourage you really to, to identify that role in your organization. An additional powerful tool to create movement in the AI transformation journey towards a higher level of maturity level is to create awareness and desire to transform. Uh, this is often achieved uh, with training or structured communication, as you were talking about before, Connie. And, and once that desire and the organization understands why there is a need to change, the companies or the organizations will have the easier task to create knowledge and ability within the organization. And this can, of course, be achieved through upscaling uh, employees or recruiting or acquiring knowledge through the help uh, with, uh, of consultancy firms. Uh, yeah uh, training and other competence enhancing initiatives related to the subject are of course all over the web and here the real challenge is to know where to start with whom and with what training should always be connected to the training uh, to the organizational strategies so the questions comes back to the management where do you want to position yourselves where can AI techniques add the most value? And where should the transformation start? Together with our partners, we have put together some training uh, programs. Uh, to name a few, we have the AI crash course, elements of AI study circle, and uh, deep dive sessions for data scientists. And I encourage you to look into our website to, to learn more about it. Uh, and actually now we are going to meet uh, David Degefeldt from Boliden. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm a little bit curious to know, uh, David, how do you work with training in your organization? Oh, well, that's a, a very good question. And, and I, I, I hope, well, I'm sorry that I can't give you an as that we're working systematic with it, but we're working uh, on a quite broad scale. Uh, since we're pretty early in our AI transformation journey, we do have some uh, initiatives around training. Uh, for instance, Elements of AI is available through our internal training platform to all employees, even though it's focused on, on uh, engineering uh, staff, naturally. Uh, but we're also, looking ahead we have we clearly see the need for more training in this area in many levels of the organization in particular for for different levels of management and um, to see how the softer sides of this and learn learn about this transformation mm -hmm. great 
And uh, you're here today to, to tell us a little bit more about your AI journey at Boliden. Yes. Yeah. So very welcome, David, once again. And the stage is yours. Thank you. OK, so uh, yes, I'm going to talk to you today about the uh, an AI journey in mining that we're currently have started. Um, my role within the company is that I'm program manager for, for the a research program uh, called AI in mining that, that has the purpose of facilitating this transformation journey in within Bulida. It's this initiative has just started this year, so we're fairly just waking up and realizing that it is actually an AI transformation that we're we're doing. Uh, so, uh, where are we currently? Well, uh, let's first have a tie back to the what to this uh, maturity level that you saw Connor present previously, and just try to identify where we are. Uh, we have definitely started with with the AI transformation, and I've, we have done our our prototypes, and and uh, we have a desire. We also have some sort of vision and started some sort of systematic implementation. Uh, but I wouldn't say where we're somewhere between experimenter and practitioner, uh, and that could perhaps be illustrated by by this picture from from our reality down down in the mine, where we have. Um, some operations. This is the loading of, of ore in, in the mine that is can be done remotely with the operator sitting uh, away from, from the machine, from the dangerous environment, uh, for, running the loading, and then it can just release the machine that then runs through the mine all by itself autonomously, and he can focus on another, another machine. So we have one operator running uh, multiple machines. Um, this would be considered a prototype, perhaps, and, and maybe not part of the uh, systematic work, well, or global work for the AI transformation. But the starting point when, when we start this journey is, is sort of a forest of, of different applications supporting our process. Um, the value chain that we're working with is, uh, of course, mining from exploration to, to through mining, concentrating, smelting, and marketing. And to support us in that, we have various systems that help us to do that. All these, or most of them, are are um, fully or fully supported by by digital IT systems. Uh, and I try to think of any process that we don't have support for. And I was thinking, hey, maybe lunches. We, we go to we eat lunch without IT support, but then I realized that we have on our information screens we have the day to day menu from the restaurant. So even eating lunch is supported by an IT system. And uh, this this is not only the physical processes, but but also the support processes like project management and and, uh, and my favorite process is of course uh, salary payments. Uh, that also have a support system in, in IT. And these systems are built around a single process or in, in some cases, multiple process, but they, are, they have everything they need for that kind of process. And that makes it very easy to maintain uh, and to manage over time. So we have a, an IT support function that works with maintaining uh, and manage these solutions. And that can be done very efficiently with isolating these applications and um, setting up different formats for all of management for all these systems. However, with with the digitalization, oh sorry, uh, with with digitalization, um, we want to increase the value from from the existing knowledge, knowledge that we have. Um, and, and the main idea here is to combine knowledge and, and get more generated value from the same base knowledge. And that means combining information sources. And this idea um, got, got us to 
dig in. Data is the new goal, this slogan that, that is, I think you've heard it many times, but this led us to, to a desire to connect all these applications that we have uh, in our various processes to be able to do this combination of data and gain the extra value. And we've done that by, by adding some, some additional applications or, or solutions for, for harvesting that data and, and providing it to different or to other presentations, for instance, like Power BI and, and creating dashboards and analytics. Uh, but what is really going on here is that we are transforming these applications per process to a layered architect architecture where the different data sources and these functions in all these applications become common across all operations. Um, and by doing that, there are some added layers that we, we need to consider like cons security and, and, and interoperability. If you look at this, this model, um, this thought model or, or conceptual model on how this is, is done, is that um, we have information traveling from the processes in the bottom and up and get refined and, and uh, presented to to users or other systems at the top. And this puts a bit strain on our, our internal organization because we're, we're currently not organized to handle these layers. Instead, we're, we need, we need to, to figure out how we should be able to maintain and manage a, a solution platform that is not application specific, but, but more general. Uh, and if we look at this, um, the potential here is very big because if we today have thousands of different applications for different processes, um, here we have a model that consists only of a few layers. If we could reduce those thousands of applications to a couple of applications per layer or systems per layer, the complexity would be reduced uh, by an order of magnitude uh, so there is a huge benefit in doing this transformation uh, but this needs to go hand in hand with changing the organization to to match this uh, this transformation of, of our support systems uh, some um, takeaways from this uh, is that IT is core business. And it's, uh, I don't know how, can I, how I can stress this <laughs> um, um, takeaway from this because um, as we do this transformation, this, the IT system is sort of what, what is driving the organization since, since um, those operations are so integrated with, with the actual work that is done. Uh, and that layers, this layered architecture is really important. It, it's much more efficient than working with separate applications. And to be able to do that, we need to have the organization that both understands and can, can make use of this. It goes sort of hand in hand. Um, yeah, I think I will. I will end there, and and thank you for 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 giving me some airtime here. Thank you. Thank so. Thank you so much for that, David. Uh, very interesting info, uh, presentation, and you will come back in the panel as well. And we are so happy to have Bolleden as one of our partners as well at AI Sweden. Uh, and if you're not a partner, uh, join us and together with us accelerate AI in Sweden. Uh, I will now uh, introduce our next AI journey case. Um, and David Fendridge from 1050. Um, hi. Hello. So we're very much looking forward to hear your case um, together with Holstby Mittal. So I'll give the word to you. Uh, yeah, sure. So 
Yeah, Sweden asked us. I'm David Fendrich from the company 1050, by the way. We help other companies in their AI journey. Uh, so we're data scientists and AI developers generally. Um, AI Sweden asked us to really quickly show one case of an AI journey and how it happens in practice, how maturity can, uh, can develop for a company in practice. Uh, so I'd like to share some slides and there will only be three of them. Uh, will be in Swedish, but I will explain. So this company is called Holsby Metal. They have large machines that uh, presses a really hot aluminum and other metals uh, into shapes, into things with uh, an enormous 800 ton press, a hot press. And sometimes things stick into this machine and they want to know why and how can we, how can we stop uh, these stops or how can we get to know them in advance? So it's uh, sort of classic predictive maintenance, right? And their machine works like this. You have uh, a storage of uh, metal rods that get fed into uh, an oven where they will be for like 15 minutes, go slowly through uh, different heat zones in an oven, and then they will be transported to a robot that puts these rods into the press and the press will drop a uh, large tool on them. Uh, this oven will be about 500 degrees warm and this is how these cylinders or rods uh, look like from the side. And there are many things that can go slightly wrong that can increase the risk for these uh, rods to stick in the machine. Uh, typically, um, if we lack one rod, then the rods on the side will get more heat. So they will be too hot. Or if we get an extra rod, if two rods come too close to each other, then they will steal uh, the heat energy from each other. That's one of many things. Uh, I'll, I'll spoil the fun by saying that in the end, the most important thing that we found was actually uh, humidity. So the air humidity that they really, in, really um, affects uh, how quickly the rods heat up and how quickly they cool down once they get to the next phase. But Holsby, they are great at what they do, but they are, are not the classic uh, analytic company. So they were quite immature. And the, here I would like to show another way of looking at maturity. Um, and it's this classical, I'm sure it's Gartner or something from, from the beginning, but the analytics staircase. Uh, in order to work with your data, you have to take each step one at a time. Uh, and the first uh, one or two steps is basically dashboarding. It's looking at your data and seeing what has happened and why did it happen humanly. Uh, and in order to know that your data is in a good shape and that you're asking the right questions and that you're asking questions that you can't already answer by simple inspection, you need to have that in place. Um, in, in this whole case, we didn't even have the data. We needed to put the sensors on the machine, sensing both things that might affect the outcome and measuring the outcome. Of course, those are the, the two standard things you need in an AI case. Measuring input, what will I use to predict, and measuring the outcome. And then, after a human has looked at, at this and uh, we know that the data works, then we can go 
for the next step, predictive uh, analysis or predictive analytics, where we uh, try to make a model that predicts, okay, given that this is the current state, what will happen next? And once we have that, once we have such, such a, a, a predictive model, then we can really make the most valuable step. You don't have to make it, but usually it's the most valuable. Okay, given what you think what will happen, what should I do to avoid it or make, or make it more of it if I want, if it's something good? So how should I act? How should I plan? So, so these would be the steps. And Holzbe had to make all these steps. So the first valuable outcome was just a dashboard for them, just where we everything we measure, both input and uh, outcomes, uh, which means that a human expert can go can look at this and say, oh, I see that the air pressure is gets too low sometimes when this other machine is running, which was one of the things that they saw. Uh, or I see that when we have um, problems, this other thing happens. And then of course, uh, since this is just a five minute uh, run through of a project, uh, we actually got to make our predictive models and actually got to predict uh, with um, when when the model predicts that there will be a stop, it's about uh, a 90% or it's nine times higher risk than when it doesn't predict it. So you can, of course, rarely uh, expect to get a full, uh, a perfect prediction from your input, but you will be able to say, now the risk is significantly higher. You should do something. So I, I think the uh, what I wanted to get here is you need the data journey as well. The data, even if you know you have it, if no one's looked at it for a couple of years, then it's probably not in the right uh, condition. So thank you so much for that, David. And I really like your analytics staircase. So thank you for showing that. Uh, we will now start the panel, so please stay on. And we also have uh, David from Boleden joining us, so welcome. And uh, Raquel, you will also be part of the panel. Yes. So let's start. And, and um, let's uh, look at your uh, answers on the Menti questions. And the first one is, have your organization started the AI journey? And we have some some different uh, answers for you. Um, some of you know, but we're planning to do so. And quite many of you have actually started your AI journey. So, uh, and, uh, so that is very interesting. Um, and also, I guess that is why you are joining here today because you, are, you want to start or you have uh, already started. So, um, Looking at the, uh, these answers, uh, David, uh, at Bolid, then do you have, I mean, you have ob obviously started your AI journey, but how would you rate yourself on this, um, in this maturity ladder? Yeah, I think it's, it's quite different because, I mean, we're a pretty big company and in some areas we've come further than others. So in, in some areas we haven't started at all, but in some we have gone, come pretty far, actually. So some of both. <laughs> yeah. Great. So uh, looking at the second question then, and now we're focusing a little bit on training. So have you taken part in any AI related training? Um, and um, Raquel, just before we uh, uh, look at the second question, what are your reflections on, on the training in the area in, in general? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I would just uh, like to comment David's uh, comment here before, and I think I think it's really uh, you're not alone. This is uh, really common, I think, in the bigger industries. We have a lot of examples, and there, of course, the training needs to be adapted. In some cases, you need really to reinforce the the learning. Uh, the, the knowledge that's already there and, and keep feeding with the, 
new new um, findings and so on. In other parts, of course, you need to make people aware of what it is. But I think that uh, to sum it up, you, you need both kind of trainings mm. to really start uh, the, this uh, transformation. And I mean, as I was uh, talking about before, it's it's a long pro process mm. to do that. And but it's really important to take into account all the aspects of, of uh, the requirements in order to achieve a, a successful AI projects. You need the domain knowledge, you need the expertise and so on. So, mm. yeah. And relating to to that, David, at 1050, I know you have a, you're, you have a lot of initiatives when it comes to uh, training and competence, uh, both internally, but also externally. So uh, would you like to describe that a little bit? Um, well, I think we have very different challenges from that of a, a large company, since this is our specialty in, in our field. This is something that we, of course, put a lot of energy into uh, every week to to share internally, and we have presentations internally every week just to 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 build our uh, knowledge all the time. And we try to spread, of course, uh, knowledge as well. To uh, we have lots of uh, seminars like this, but. Uh, many others as well, where we try to explain what AI is, what you can use it for, uh, because it's AI cannot be only a a, a technical or an, an IT challenge. It, it has to solve a business problem, and that's where it gets complicated, because that means that business and IT have to understand each other and have to talk to each other. And in a large company especially, that rarely happens. So part of what we have to do is that we have to explain as well as possible what is possible. What types of projects can you expect to get good returns on? What can you expect to do? Uh, and, and be as educational as possible so that we can give some of our knowledge to the business side. And then so they can give some of their knowledge to us and we sort of can meet in the middle. And I think that's what needs to happen for for companies internally as well. There has to be a lot of cross-functional, uh, a lot more cross-functional approach than in other types of projects. We have to yeah. understand each other better. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I uh, definitely agree with you. We have to understand each other. It's a very good conclusion. And now we also have your answers. Uh, uh, have you taken part in an AI-related training? Training, And many of you have. Um, and uh, that is uh, very positive, I think. Uh, and that is also relating to that many of you have actually started your AI journey as well. So Raquel, uh, connecting this, what we are doing at AI Sweden when it comes to uh, training and our courses, what, what are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy that I see that uh, at least of those who have answered have taken their own initiative to, to, to understand the subject of AI. And I think that uh, really here the answers is a really clear sign to the organizations that the, the, we are ready. <laughs> we are ready to learn more. And, and by taking the chance of organizing and, and and communicating uh, all of the initiatives from the organizations, I think that that will uh, better lead people in the transformation that you want to make in your organization, because uh, otherwise, you know, it will be all over the place. Uh, but if you really think about it and make it structured, or even, you know, do a good communication, uh, then I think that you will be achieving quite a lot. But I'm really, really happy that people are taking uh, training. Uh, David, uh, I have a question from uh, from um, the chat to you. Um, so, um, looking at your AI journey and what you presented, what do you wish that you had known before you started? Uh, which David? It's very uh, confusing. David, like David, oh, yeah, I know, I know. It's <laughs> and it's even harder for me, you know. So at Bulid and then. Uh, whoa. 
that uh, that is uh, uh, oh, I really don't know how to answer. What what is it known that it, that it actually is a transformation? I would say. I mean, our company is is ninety years old. We 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 are as many Swedish big companies. Uh, we are very lean. We we have the bare minimum in in terms of staffing and and very streamlined organizations. And doing a transformation in that with in, in that setting is is challenging because you have very little room you production still needs to go on and so you don't you can't just take a step back and say okay how can we try this to do this different uh, just the realization that it is a transformation it, it will change the organization uh, from the ground up or maybe from the top and down but all parts will be affected mm, and another uh... Another question from the chat to you, David, at, at 10.50. So uh, what should an organization uh, just starting the AI journey do? And I think, uh, I mean, you have, uh, of course, uh, presented the analytics um, part, but uh, what else would you recommend an organization just starting the AI journey? What should they do? I think really early what you want to do is uh get a feel someone at least someone has to know what sort of data do we have in the company uh, in the different in all the different systems and in what shape is it how much is it and try to get interview uh, around the organization to get to know what sort of potential cases do I have that's obviously the first thing you need to know. What what cases, if, if I'm going to make this journey, what are the possible uh, directions that the journey can take? And what resources do I have to make the journey? Yes. And connecting that, Raquel, with the uh, uh, education, um, uh, educations and trainings, uh, what should you think of when just starting your uh, when you're in at the first that first level just starting your ai journey um i think that uh, uh just by your you know yourself asking yourself that question you already are showing signs of curiosity uh, and i just uh, would say just go with it i think that the more you learn about the subject the more you would like to know about it. Uh, and it's so cool because there is so many fields uh, to, to learn about. Uh, there are so many techniques and new findings. Uh, so, so I think that uh, there is uh, a lot of material out there to, to learn. So, so I would just say, um, you know, keep learning, keep having fun, keep sharing your thoughts with other people. I think that that is also something that is really good to do to put your own words into what you are uh, learning so yeah and a final question for you david at boliden how um, do you recommend others to to start this journey uh well i would say start begin somewhere uh, and begin uh, you need an agile or, or as you call it a lean, I prefer to use the term agile, but, but you need to take this iteratively and you need to do many mistakes. You need to try and, and go ahead and you will learn so much in, in that process and know where your, your goal will be apparent eventually. And what about you, David, uh, from 1050's uh, side? Um, some last words on this subject, starting your AI journey. It will be, well, it might be odd for me, coming from a super technical side, but it will be a people journey. It has to do with changing how people work and transforming an organization. So your challenges will not be primarily technical. It will be human. I love that as a final word for this uh, panel. 
So thank you so much for taking part in the panel. We will have a quick break. And after the break, we will focus on creating business and user value with AI. So uh, see you then. Bye.
So welcome back to our third block uh, today. And uh, we are now, now going to focus on value, business and user value with AI. Yeah. Mm, and uh, we will start this block as well with some Menti questions. So looking at the Menti questions for this block, there we go. Uh, how many proof of concepts have gone into production in your organization that you are aware of? Uh, how many processes in your organization will include AI in three to five years? So now we're looking a bit ahead then. And also, do you think your business model will, will change uh, with um, AI? So please use the QR code um, or the link to answer these questions and we will show them in the panel. And uh, Peter, you will now introduce this block. Yes. So what is value? It, well, yeah, what, what is value? That's a super good question and that's why we are here. So um, some of you are familiar with me. I, I've been uh, working with AI Sweden for since we started uh, two and a half year ago now. And really, we can talk about AI as much as we want. But in the end, the technology is something that has to produce value for humanity, for the society we live in, and especially for our organizations. So value is really something that gets us to where we want. It's a way for us to, to solve the problems uh, that we need to solve, e either strategical or operational. So value is, is doing things better than we do today. Uh, that can have an economic impact and can uh, strengthen our uh, capabilities uh, inside our organization that can make us more competitive. So really, AI as a technology is all about creating value. And just as David said uh, from 1050 here earlier, we need to start with solving real business problems or real operational problems with AI. So that's what this block is about. Hmm. Uh, great. So. Um, um... Yes, yeah. I'll hand that to you. And we will now have some more introduction to this block. And um, yeah, so the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vanya. Uh, so uh, really what we want to focus on, on here and now on with the AI transformation program is really how we create value with AI as a technology, with AI as an enabler for value for your organization. Because that's really what we see that AI Sweden is about, helping you uh, Need, understand AI so that you can start applying AI to create real value in your organization. But we have to start with popcorn somewhere because uh, uh, I have the privilege in, in doing a podcast that we called AI for CXOs and Leaders. It's in Swedish, but it's available on, on all available or all uh, podcast platforms. And really, there's a couple of really interesting analogies. But one uh, we need to start with, it's, it's talking about popcorn because popcorn is really what we need to get away from. Uh, in terms of AI. We need to get away from uh, AI projects being more of, of popcorn projects, just happening in organization without a goal or uh, without being aligned really with, with what we need to focus on, with what problems we want to solve. Uh, so in, instead of, of having popcorns, managers and leaders in organizations today need to understand that AI is no longer a technology, uh, a technology challenge. It really is a, a people, a human, a leader challenge. And one of the things that are really hard to, uh, for organizations to do is to change mindsets in, instead of doing incremental changes, doing, being more of an explorative organization, being more uh, like you do in, in research. But once again, having a clear strategic goal with why you're doing what you're doing. So investing across the organization, but changing to a more explorative mindset, as, as Anders Arptig mentioned in, in the podcast. Uh, and what we need to align this to is what Connie talked about earlier. It's really about finding the real use cases that will create value for your organization. Like finding the, those things that uh, keeps managers up at night, uh, finding the processes in your organization that you can optimize that will create value. So by optimizing uh, a couple of percentages in, in certain uh, processes can really have an impact 
on the bottom line in in economic sense. And I know uh, Martin Rukfeldt from Sentian uh, will do a presentation about this later on in this block. Uh, so talking about business and talking about ROIs with AI, uh, we will launch uh, some groups here uh, later on uh, that we will where we will focus on these things. How can we convince managers to start investing more strategically in AI projects, understanding what you can use the technology for? And what I want to mention is like three different stratas of, of uh, ROIs that you can get with AI projects in your organizations. First, you can have the, the capabilities ROI. And, and uh, we talk about this as, as playing with the technology. It's, uh, it still can be like popcorn projects, but it's more strategically in, in how do we increase our organizational capabilities. So, so really then it's a strategic uh, project to increase our um, competence and the knowledge within the organizations. And then we have measurable or economic ROI in certain types of projects. And that, uh, that's projects that really has a, a effect on the bottom line or where we can measure the economic impact of the projects. For example, if we improve or optimize this process, that will create this amount of value for us, or we will get that in return. And then we have the strategic ROIs, which uh, we truly believe in, in, in getting the mentee question, for example, how many of our processes will uh, include AI in three to five years? Uh, if we look at that in five years or 10 years, try to mention one process that will not include AI. So doing the strategic ones is really about aligning that vision of, uh, within five years uh, and, and start building those projects that will transform your organization. But to do so, you need to start with the people inside the organization. You need to start changing, increasing the uh, knowledge and increasing the competence of uh, AI. And that is especially on a management level. Uh, so that is why looking at the AI maturity assessments uh, Connie presented earlier, that's really a, a tool for uh, management to understand where you are and what steps you need to take. So going from not started or experimenter to more of a practitioner, for example, or more into a professional organization, it takes time, but you have to start that. And uh, to help that challenge or to help that process, what we are doing now within AI Sweden and the uh, AI transformational team is putting a lot of focus on this business value. So I really want to highlight our uh, AI Sweden partner days that will happen between the, the it will happen the 4th, the 5th and the 6th of May. Uh, on the 4th, we will have a, a sole focus on business value. It's the business day. We will go through use cases. We will uh, get you inspired by what our partners are doing. Uh, we will talk more about AI transformation and about the journey we're on. Uh, so really sign up for the partner days. And what we're also launching is a new network. It's the AI Catalyst network that will focus on uh, a number of people. We will uh, get a group and a network together where we want catalysts uh, in your organizations uh, to be a part of this so that we can help you and together in the network, help you start accelerating uh, your journey. So it's really about uh, sharing networks. We will have two representatives uh, from each partner. Uh, Preferably, there will be uh, AI change agents. Uh, there will be six meetings each year and a community around this. Uh, so it's really about supporting each other, uh, sharing insights, uh, sharing knowledge, and getting a lot of tools. So it will be uh, filled with training and learnings. It will be uh, filled with uh, experts in the field, both national and international. Uh, and we will have the first meeting in, ha happening in the mid of May. So uh, there will be a sign up link here uh, later on in the chat. So if you're interested, sign up, register your interest now. Uh, and with that said, uh, I would like to uh, hand over to you again, Vanya, uh, to introduce uh, Vinit and David. So thank you, Peter. So uh, Vinit Parida and David Schödin from uh, Lul Luleå University will now um, introduce your work on, um, uh, on how business model innovation 
it looks like with AI. So we're so happy to have you here. So hi, Vinit and David. Hello, uh, and it's a pleasure to be joining you all today. Uh, let me just try to put up our slide. Um, I think, yeah, now it should work. All right, so uh, it's a pleasure to be connecting with you all today and uh, to have so many of you joining in to listening to our presentation and of course AI Sweden for the invitation so we could share our research findings with you. Uh, we have planned for a 15 minutes short presentation for you and what we'll be really discussing today is how AI drives business model innovation in an industrial ecosystem and to be able to have this conversation we will try so to conceptualize you. Sorry to interrupt you, Vinit. Can you just, uh, we have your presenter view now. So if you can just change uh, to the. All right, thank you for that. <laughs> Let's see. Um, is it full screen now? So, so presenter view and slideshow over there. So yeah, yeah now, you. perfect. Okay. Um, all right, so in addition to, um, so of course we'll be talking about some conceptualizations uh, around these key topics, as well as barriers and solutions um, towards how an organization to actually approach uh, AI-driven business model. Um, so my name is Vineet, as uh, Raquel mentioned, and David Shudin, and we both have been leading uh, initiatives around digitalization and new business model for the last 10 years. And of course, we have published a lot of academic papers and wrote practitioner papers. Uh, and I think we are quite glad to also share with you that you know right now we are working also with the Swedish Ministry's high-level committee focusing on policy actions that would enable Swedish companies to undertake digital transformation. And we think this is a very important step that we need to take within Sweden uh, to ensure our future competitiveness. So of course we're working with multiple research projects, but our overall goal is to support digital business model innovation in Swedish industrial ecosystems. And perhaps our flagship project in this regard is the Begin project where we have over 40 plus partners from diverse areas of Swedish industry. And maybe the interesting part of this project is that we're truly having this ecosystem perspective. So we have ecosystems in forestry, in process industries, in mining industries, and manufacturing smart cities, for example, and, and having diverse actors also engaged in these ecosystems, such as the leading suppliers like ABB, Volvo, and Scania, their most progressive customers, for example, Bo Liden and SEA and Skanska, but also many leading digital actors like IBM and Microsoft, uh, but also these innovative SMEs like Mobilaris uh, and, and so on. And of course, focusing on, on concrete use cases like the digital transformation and mining or the mine automation programs. Uh, has been very in, insightful in looking into how these actors actually work together in an ecosystem setting. So, um, of course, we are having a conversation which is very complex because there are so many parts that you need to consider. And we have at least tried to conceptualize it from our perspective of how do these different pieces come together. And what we come across is that when we are talking about AI and digitalization, we are really talking about new business models that needs to be uh, introduced by organizations. And, well, of course, what is really being the focus here is how to achieve sustainable industry goal. And I think many Swedish companies are looking into this and are ambitious enough to have an approach where they can really hit the bullseye here, to come up with solutions that will address an economical, environmental, and social benefit. And digitalization and more particularly AI is an enabling force for that. However, the, as um, previously being discussed, AI on its own is not enough. You really need to come up with a new business model, which is actually a missing piece of this puzzle. But the complexity doesn't end here with you changing 
your business model. It's also about how do you change your business model in collaboration or in tandem with the industrial ecosystem. And obviously, this is much, much more complex conversation as you often need to negotiate, you need to um, predict how other the ecosystem would be evolving uh, with your business model. And this makes the whole situation much more complex. So one more definition <laughs> to kind of discuss before we get into the barriers and solution side of the conversation is around what is a business model. And I think this is an important part also because often people are talking about business model as in revenue model. But the way we look upon it is that a business model is truly a way for how organization creates, delivers, and captures value. So it's actually really a holistic road blueprint for an organization to ensure that they're going to be competitive in the future. So it's very much looking into if we're going to work with a specific AI technology and have a focus on sustainable goals, um, then what value do we need to create? What specific customer needs do we need to address? How are we going to ensure that value is going to be delivered? What new processes, routines internally do we need to introduce? Who do we need to partner? up with and of course how are we going to capture this value what should be the risk level we should operate in and what cost structure to consider as well as the revenue model and often the most important part of the conversation is working with all these dimensions together so there is an alignment between them and that is uh, also a very important part to consider so obviously AI is a truly transformative uh, force towards the whole business model and all the three dimensions that Vinit has been talking about. Uh, and making that transformation, of course, confronts a lot of problems. So, so let's talk about those. So getting an AI solution up and running for a paying customer can be a quite complex journey from this point A to point C. And um, there are many traps on the way. So we have actually identified three distinct traps with AI commercialization. And each of these relate to one of the components of value creation, value delivery, and value capture. So let's talk about the first one then, pushing out a digital or an AI solution without understanding the customer value. So we see that engineers and digital officers are often quite enthusiastic about applying AI and, and trying to solve these technological problems and just seeing the potential of the technology. But they often have a challenge to truly understand what is the concrete customer needs or end user needs that you would be addressing and is this the most valuable? So what we find is that many companies have been lacking in their uh, efforts to kind of evaluate what is the customer truly willing to pay for. It's fun to test and try out AI technology. Of course, you want to learn. But what is it that will actually be scalable in the long term and that the company customer will employ for a long time? So quite common trap we have seen. Uh, the second one, promising customer gains without understanding the value delivery process. And of course, this is super critical. That's actually how value will be created over time in the value delivery processes of the organization. And of course, most traditional companies don't have the appropriate routines and, uh, and capabilities in their frontline staff to be using AI uh, and, and supporting the customer in those things. Uh, of course, you also need to consider you know, variations among different customer sites and the scalability potential from, from that. <laughs> Something that works in one specific site won't work in another. Uh, and then maybe a, a, the main challenge here is also kind of ma managing this clash of culture between the more traditional reactive product sales and so on to, to moving on to uh, AI sales, which is much more proactive and where you need to engage with the customer throughout to kind of pick up on what the AI is telling you to optimize or to improve. Uh, finally, uh, getting sold on an AI opportunity without understanding the profit formula. Uh, so this is, of course, quite complex if you're not used to, to selling these type of <laughs> solutions and actually lack the benchmarks to be able to do uh, to analyze the financial parameters and also uh, evaluate different scenarios for how it would actually be. And I think one of the co most common traps that companies actually face here is, is kind of miscalculating those hidden costs inherent in transforming an organization to AI offers because AI offerings, because uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to try it out on a specific use case, but if you're gonna sell those type of solution on a larger scale, of course you are, um, 
need to invest in a whole backbone of infrastructure and, and, and technicians to maintain those systems over time. And, and that can often be kind of forgotten in what we have seen. So what you end up with is this leaking bucket. Uh, so this is the value leakage of the business model, we would say. Uh, so a lot of, of, of the potential value that you are creating from, uh, from AI would be lost, both for the customer that don't see the true value being generated, but also for, for you as a company uh, that don't get the profits that were intended. So now we will move into um four suggestions of how could you organize yourself to ensure a profitable AI solution development. And of course, we have primarily been focusing on industrial companies, uh, so very much in B2B setup, but we think many of the issues we will be raising here would be relevant for a wider audience. Um, so I will go quickly here because this is a similar point actually to the, to the traps I just mentioned. It, we see that it's critical to evaluate your business model for the AI solution before uh, engaging in commercialization of those offerings. So truly assessing the value proposition that, you're, that you have with your solution. And we have, of course, seen also that it's easy to uh, misunderstand even uh, what the customer is really after. It's not just about mapping their needs. It's about understanding what are their true needs. Uh, so often what you need is a clear data-driven understanding of the customer's uh, pain points. Uh, of course, you need to man mitigate this delivery risk. Uh, so how can we ensure that we deliver those concrete value for our customers and, and, and are involved in actually changing the customer behavior and improving our own, for example, maintenance routines by using the AI? Uh, needs to be considered before uh, commercializing. And then modeling the financial impact uh, of, of solutions under different scenarios. So under which conditions does the business model make sense, truly? So the second solution uh, we would like to discuss is very much around this idea of microservices. And what is really unique is that we have often found that large manufacturing companies are working with some analytical solution or a digital solution. And what they have is a very complex product that they would like to offer to the customer. And often customer is not even ready or even prepared to be able to take on uh, this kind of, of an offering. So what you need to really consider in an AI offers development is that it requires an extended period of core development and commercialization. And this is something that you need to, how do you say, ingrained within the development part of the uh, project. So what we would like to highlight here is that, okay, so if we're going to do some kind of joint work with the customer, how do you organize yourself for that? And it's very important to actually have a conversation with the customer and to actually communicate quite clearly that it is going to be some kind of joint investment. Well, maybe it's not a financial joint investment from a customer side, but at least the effort and the time needed from their organization would be relevant. Um, so what we figured out is that Many organizations fail with these initiatives often because AI de solution development often requires a whole organizational setup to be involved throughout the hierarchy. And that kind of a commitment is very difficult to secure. But for example, what we have seen within a large manufacturing companies from the um, digital side and a utility provider, how did they organize their solution development with a microservice approach? So well, what we start, started with is creating a digital steering team. And this was team from both sides um, with top management executives that were responsible for collecting the technological development ideas that would be in the focus. And here you can understand that there is a bit of a push and a pull, right? So as a provider, you are of, co of course looking into solution developments that are going to be very much scalable while as a customer, you're often pushed into having your problem solved, very highly customized problem. And what they needed to do was to kind of jointly agreed upon what investment should we do? What should be the first microservice investment we should consider from both perspectives? And once that investment was decided, they handed it over to an agile techni technical development team. And this agile technical development team was again, consisting of both sides. And the key focus here was very much about getting the proof of concept, if it works. And then finally, this was handed over to the operational team from both sides, which could work with really implementing it, learning by doing. 
And once this loop is completed, the organizations were ready to do the next investment. And as you can understand, as they do different <coughs> microservice development loop, what happens for the product uh, you know, the provider organization is that they also take the customers through a transformational journey, build the trust and actually secure commitment towards future engagement. And often some solutions would be developed that are not able to be kind of commercialized or scaled, but some are, and, and I think that's a win there already. Yeah, so Binet was actually mentioning some of the key benefits of this approach, of course, that for, from a customer uh, point of view, of course, you can get these customized solutions to your key pain points. And you also uh, can see those quick win wins that demonstrate the potential of AI within your organization, uh, which allows you to continue working, build legitimacy also within operations, for example. Uh, to invest in this journey. Uh, of course, for a provider uh, trying to engage in this is demonstrated and scalable offering. So you have, a, uh, over time, you build this extensive portfolio of micro uh, microservice mm. uh, offerings or modules that can then be recombined and scaled to other, uh, other customer settings and other. So it, it's a very much a, a learning approach that we're talking about here. And of course, this capability development of actually learning how to deliver those type of values uh, is also important. Coming back to one of the key traps that we were talking about. So getting your service technicians, or at least some of them being out there and implementing and, and, and learning how to actually use and support the customer in using these type of technologies. Um, so then our um, third learning actually is to scale AI uh, through ecosystem in integration. And of course, we're talking very much about, um, you know, advancing and being able to do it much more quickly, uh, quickly and with a broad, broader depth of focus. Uh, so don't do it alone, partner with some of the AI leaders. We see that IBM and Microsoft and these type of actors are, have been very important for much of the Swedish industry, providing the backbone of the, in terms of infrastructure and, and a lot of the anal analytics software, the cloud uh, solutions that allow companies to take on this AI journey. Uh, we also see the collaboration with innovating SMEs like Mobilaris or perhaps Sentian AI, which we'll be presenting uh, later have a very important role actually of creating this innovative approach uh, together. Those partnerships have been very important for, for many of the companies to kind of learn and see the potential and the way of working with these type, new type of technologies. Because these are young, flexible and digitally born companies that, that kind of lead the path to how you need to work uh, in, a, in, a, in the digital age in some way. Uh, of course, opening APIs and providing this software development kits for internal and external users allow you to kind of have a much more customizable uh, setup for, for many of the solutions. But maybe the uh, other thing that we find is really important is harnessing this ecosystem generativity and building an ecosystem around the company. So AVB has been quite progressive with setting up the Synerleap program and connecting many, many startups around them. And of course, maybe this hasn't started the materials fully yet, but it's when you're able to build on that whole infrastructure and backbone that you have of data and being co collecting that, but using other companies to derive value out of that data and actually combining different solutions, uh, uh, both from your internally, but from your ecosystem to create something bigger. That's when the generativity truly can be impactful. So as David is mentioning, uh, the ecosystem collaboration or you know, having an engagement view on ecosystem is super important. Um, and I would say that this is probably one of the key conversations we hear often. Uh, but this is quite complex because in an ecosystem which is not really established, it's not obvious as an organization, what role you should say it and what should be the logic of your collaboration here. And what we have often found um, is that Traditionally, product-centric companies, um, you know, the long heritage are very, very good in competition-based models. So, so they, 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 they see an ecosystem, they want to basically lead that ecosystem. That's the approach. And often they are quite able to do that because they have the muscles and the power and kind of the position to do that. 
But often um, they also start to realize that they don't have everything and they need to collaborate. And I think probably, I'm sure many of you have been in many webinars where collaboration has been highlighted to be one of the most important activity that everyone needs to talk about. And I think that's true as well. However, we have a different message. I think our message is very much about that companies need to not only collaborate, but also compete simultaneously. And this is much more complex. And this cooperation perspective is where often many of the players find them a bit lost because their organization is very much about, well, we don't know how to collaborate with this actor because we have only seen them as a competitor. But in this customer site, we need to collaborate with them. So how do you really work with the cooperation model? What ecosystem strategies do you consider? And that's what we want to little bit dig into. Um, Let's say you are a company on the left side in a mining ecosystem, right? So how do you start? What solution or what strategy should you take when you see the ecosystem around it? And I think the first point we want to highlight is that don't, don't kind of start inwards. Don't start with what you want to do, but rather focus on the customer context. With AI and digital technology, customer context matters a lot and probably more or less decides if it is really possible for you to apply a certain strategy or not. So what are the specific needs, the scope of collaboration that you're able to address? Are you able to really integrate with the ecosystem actors that are there? And I think that kind of a full assessment on the customer side is super critical for AI development. And once you have that, then I think you could potentially start to look into the what role you should look into. So do you have the necessary digital capabilities? Do you have the strategic partnership on the specific customer side? Would other suppliers follow you and the role you want to lead? If the answer is yes, potentially you could take a leadership strategy. And if the answer is no, then probably you need to consider a follower strategy. Let's focus on that leadership strategy a little bit more. So here, I guess a leadership strategy is very much about being able to coordinate and organize collaboration with many different actors, also ensuring that the data exchange happens. Also having the mindset in the whole development phase that you need to let Others make benefit, not only your organization. So there needs to be enough benefit generation that maybe sometimes even kind of diminishes benefit for you, but is better for the customer side. And if you are able to take it in that way, uh, so then you actually are taking an orchestration strategy, really coordinating multiple actors and trying to maximize the value. And if the answer is no, probably you have a dominator, you'll still lead, but with a very limited scope of collaboration. And of course, we can also take on the right side, similar set of questions, which leads to two other strategies, which is being a complementer and being a protector. I specifically want to highlight the complementer strategy because this is something we have seen to be super important. Uh, many of our leading companies that we have talked with have recognized that being a complementer is a very profitable Finit, business. I, I'm sorry, but I have to, uh, we have to conclude now. So, but it's right. super interesting. And, uh, and let's discuss this more in the panel, I think, because it's a, a very important aspect that you bring up here. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, we will move on to the, uh, into the next case now and that we will see you again in the panel so looking yeah, forward thank to you that. so much and uh martin uh i'll give the word to you then at sentian now can you hear me now yeah, no. Yes, we can hear you. Ah, sorry about that. So you can see me, you can hear me. Let's try then the slides in that case. Yes. Perfect. You should be. All right. Tell me if you can see my slides. Yes. yes. Very good. Thank you very much. So uh, yeah, my name is Martin Rubfeldt. I'm the CEO and founder of Sentian.ai. And um, yeah, we see ourselves as an industrial AI company. And I'm going to talk about a case. The uh, case is uh, Yumo, and it's about smart industry and process optimization. So a few words about Yumo. It's a, a high-tech manufacturer of automation systems and sensors. 
they have many advanced machines and it's a highly competitive market and, and so and um, uh, they want to sort of have an edge on the competition and that is why they looked into AI and uh, they wanted to reduce cost and add re revenues. So the strategic goals were there uh, for them and um, uh, we got cracking on it. Um, and what they had, they had chosen a, a case uh, here where they had a, a, a slight problem and it was, you know, they were looking for, for the right case and they've been working on certain things for, for quite some time. And they found this that, that showed promise for them. And uh, they, they experienced a, a small but significant process variation for, for this uh, thin film temperature sensors uh, with platinum. And they wanted to improve the accuracy and, uh, of the sensor and, and the overall yield. And, this is an interesting case from many perspectives, um, both business and, and uh, technical. And if we start off by, by just saying a few words about the technical side, they didn't have a lot of data. Uh, they thought they had a lot of data. They gave us huge amounts of data, but apparently that data was a lot of duplication that couldn't really be used. Uh, and that's quite common in these situations. The variation, it drifted over time, so it wasn't always in the same place. And, and the sources of this variation was also complex, and it wasn't completely understood. And that's another very common situation in the industry, that you have a process, you understand inputs and outputs of it, but you don't quite understand what's going on on the inside. And it can't always be really easily understood. And, and that's actually a great case for AI where we people can't understand everything because there's so many variables and it's so complicated, but AI can. And they also had a time lag in the process where they made, made some changes to the process and, and did some updates and the results weren't val, uh, visible until much later. And this is also quite a common situation in if one wants to be really practical about several data, these data science challenges. And uh, that can be handled and, and, and we did so in the project. Uh, we implemented our sentient controller for adaptive process variation uh, reduction in their automation control system for this, this process. And uh, we have many models that are uh, helping each other in this and, and we automatically recommend and settings for, for the uh, machines. Uh, and um, it was deployed in 2019. We actually managed to squeeze out 20% of improvements in, in the proportion of sensors to the highest quality tier. And that's quite considerable. Uh, the ROI is, is, is very fast if you can do such an improvement. Uh, now it handles these updates very automatically uh, and they're looking to implement uh, this and, and, and they are implementing this in, in other parts of their uh, factories. Uh, so I wanted to just summarize a few things then uh, of, of what I just talked about. So this can be generalized. Uh, so there's many industries that have these kinds of problems. And, and the goals are usually the same when we look at these kinds of, of situations. Uh, they're reducing cost or, or uh, adding revenues or, or for that matter, the sustainable industry perspective that is coming to play into play more and more. The problems are usually the same. Uh, the variation uh, problem is, is, is everywhere. There's high scrap levels. Energy use is that is is, is really high, and, and then envi environmental impact and maintenance or or yield or, or combinations of these. So so we recognize that they come back again and again, and from a data science perspective, so very little data. You need to be able to work with little data because even if you think you have a lot of data, that's often not the case. And this variation, it may not be this stable and the processes that are, that are not well understood. So these are uh, data science problems that we need to deal with. Um, and from a data science uh, or data perspective, uh, this data usually comes from these kind of things like control system or IoT systems. And you have to find ways to, to get access to them. But a lot of data is already in place and you may not always have been looking for it in the right place. So uh, I think this um, is, is an interesting uh, case. Uh, it shows all of these uh, aspects to it. And uh, 
I mean, in most cases they have, uh, when it comes to AI, very good uh, return on investments and, and are very successful, even there, if there's a lot of discussions about these uh, failed projects and the graveyards of, of, of projects in, in AI. What we see is that most of these cases actually work out pretty well. Right, that was it. So thank you so much, Martin, for that. And we're now moving on to the panel. So please, David and Vinit, join us as well. And Peter, you will be part of the panel. Yes. Uh, and we will now um, start to reflecting a bit on uh, on uh, the many questions. The first one was uh, how many uh, proof of concepts have gone in, into production? And we have also got a question from the chat. And, and I think this one is for you, uh, Martin, um, uh, how to really uh, get go from uh, proof of uh, concept to proof of value and uh, what are the main issues with that and how can we overcome that so and um, well going from proof of concept to proof of value has a lot to do with the business cases you have to to pick the right one and obviously you can look for different goals here so you can look for um, a pain point that you want to solve, as in the primarily in the case of Yumo, they had this variation they wanted to reduce or deal with. Uh, in other cases, it's the opportunity in the marketplace. If we can reposition ourselves uh, with a new business model that can be supported by AI or something like that, then that is the, the driver. But you have to find this and, and not only look for the technology. I think the technology is important, the data is important, but you have to look for the business case that provides a lot of value to you and tie that in. Look for the KPIs, uh, look for the organization to support it so that you get into a, uh, uh, a process where it's adopted by the organization. Hmm. And uh, do you have some reflections? Um, yeah, I think um, well, we got the comment in the chat as well, and uh, that we are talking and, and we're talking, Martin is also mentioning the graveyard of projects. Mm -hmm. And the graveyard of projects is really when we do POCs and then don't really know either what to do with them or they're not successful. Uh, so uh, we actually uh, did, um, did a slide of this because we need to start transforming our mindset in doing POCs to POVs. We can do, we can do proof of concepts on a, a capability level where we train our organizations to, to play around with the technology, but then when we are, want to put them in production, there need to be a mindset of proof of value. So it, do we optimize a process? Do we solve a problem with the help of the technology? Or do we build an entire new product? Uh, and, and in terms of, of Vinit and uh, David here, it, do we need to change our business model? So really uh, changing that mindset towards a, a proof of value is something that you do from the beginning when you start the project. How do we do, uh, what do we do if it's a su successful? What's our plan B and plan C and so forth? So, so really changing mindset from proof of concept to proof of value is super important in, in this stage on the AI transformation journey. Hmm. And uh, connecting to that, which I also think is very important, um, Vinit and David, if you were to dream a bit, what are your dream scenario? How far have we, we come with uh, AI and, and how do the business models look in, uh, let's say, three years? Uh, that's a <laughs> difficult question. Um, maybe I would like to just go back to the previous question very shortly. And I think great you know, replies from Martin and Peter. And I was just thinking like what we have seen uh, for many of the companies because they were doing so many proof of concepts was very much that they stopped all that after a point and realized if we don't have a paying customer, we're not gonna do that development. And that paying customer doesn't need to cover everything but should be willing to at least provide the effort uh, for that development part. And, and I think that's a good parameter to really think, is their value really exists? Um, moving to your question, Rakesh, when, when you mention about you know, the future scenario, I think the future scenario for us is very clear when it comes to the business model. And it is so that companies will need to think about multiple business model with multiple revenue streams and having the possibility to configure the business model depending upon the ecosystem 
or the collaboration with companies. So what we will quite quickly move away from is the standardized revenue models, which had been previously very much about product centric, right? So you sell the product, you get paid, and then you add on a service contract. I think as soon as you add the digital layer to it, you have multiple revenue streams that are flowing and they may flow in different um, intensities over the different collaboration period. And to be able to cope with that is super important. Um, and I think that's going to be like a key key kind of recommendation for companies that are working with business model development. Thank you. And a last question for you, Martin. Where are we in three years when it comes to AI? How many um, processes will include AI? <laughs> so um, I, I, um, I think you can take that from many perspectives. There's a technological as aspect. We're we're actually getting new AI or permutations of AI or, or algorithms again and again. We're seeing GTP3 and we're seeing transformers and we're seeing new ways uh, of combining AI with the other parts of technology that, that takes leaps and bounds forward. Then there is the uh, business perspective of, of uh, I, I think we're seeing a, a sort of the business perspective being drawn the organizations or, or the companies are being a bigger and bigger digital divide because some companies are understanding they need to get in on this and others are waiting for it to happen and, and, and are followers. And uh, because of the speed of development on a technical uh, and uh, business um, uh, process uh, evol uh, evolution, it goes so fast that it, there's a big risk that we, we see a bigger and bigger divide between the leaders and the laggards. And, and, and finally, on the implementation side, uh, the ones that are not understanding that this is AI is infrastructure for them, the ones that missed out on the problem uh, on, uh, on the internet boom and, and didn't get in on AI on internet have been, you know, had a lot of problems. And, and, and we, we're going to see this uh, even worse when it comes to AI, because AI is a so much more powerful technology than the internet technology was. It has much more wide uh, reaching implications for companies. So, so this, um, this, uh, these companies that are, are looking at AI, they need to see that this infrastructure and they need to invest in it and they got to get it into their operations. And I am hopeful that when we look at the industry that we can see that they are implementing uh, AI projects. But I think there is a need for many companies to, to reflect on the speed of implementation in order to not get left behind. Hmm. So thank you so much for that, Martin, and also Vinit and David. Thank you so much for taking part of the panel. Um, Peter, there are so many discussions. There are so many discussions to, to jump on, to continue. And I really see, to, and to follow up on Martin's um, explanation, we really see uh, some really uh, transformative organizations here, for example, Sentian, for example, 1050, Moduli, uh, that does this work to, uh, together with their partners. And I, I think that we'll see two different types of shifts here for our partners and for, for Swedish industry, for example. We will see one evolutionary shift where the industry is really, really good today. They do a lot of incremental um, um, improve, improvements on processes. So, so that's where a case right now where they can apply AI. And then we will see more of the revolutionary side once they've evolutionized AI. Uh, so uh, we will see some revolutions uh, coming in, in the coming years, but that will take time. Uh, so we have a lot of partners that can help industrial players, that can help public organizations and private organizations to really accelerate. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see what the future holds. And we will uh, keep, uh, continue these discussions, right, in the Catalyst Network yes. and in other initiatives, and we'll come back with more information on that later yeah. on. Yeah, the, the next thing uh, you should do is to sign up for uh, the Partner Days, um, because there's three days of the, this type of, of setup where we will continue the discussions, where we, on the first day, we'll focus on business, the second day, we'll focus on uh, data, and on the third day, we'll fo have more of a focus on, on the technical stuff in, in algorithmic development. So go to AI.se and sign up for Partner Days today. Yes. And uh, Connie, I will introduce, uh, I will just welcome you also up to, on the stage to, uh, for some final words and to conclude this uh, morning. 
Um, so um, uh, we have uh, a mentee question. We will see if it turns uh, up in the background and then uh, answer that and we'll get your feedback on your main takeaways um, on today. But what are your main takeaways, Connie? Oh, wow. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, AI transformation, this, this has really been just an introduction, you know, looking at, you know, uh, on a high level on what this is. And, and we really need to follow up this discussion, have separate discussions and webinars on each going down on, in a deep dive on each of these subjects. Uh, we've talked a lot about people, that it's about people and, and change does, organizations doesn't change, it's people that in organizations has changed, right? But at the same time, it's we need to understand the technology, just what we heard from Erdjerd and, and from David and Boliden, that you know, they changes the layers which actually affects the organizations. So we have a, a technology, in this case AI, that actually drives the change. And then, you know, with Vinit and, and, and we, we have the business models. So we really have the AI transformations is really the intersection of technology, people, and business. And we can't, you know you know, forget about one of those circles, we really need to understand how they all intersect together. And that's why it's such an interesting field and, and why it's also so complicated. And so so this is just a, a start of, of something that we will have a lot of more to come uh, around this from AI Sweden. Mm. And uh, uh, I think was it was uh, also very uh, good that we launched the AI assessment tool today. So what should you do if you're interested in using that for your organization? Yep. So we will uh, send out a, a link to a survey where you can uh, set up if you're interested in the assessment tool, the Catalyst network, and some of the other uh, things we talked about today, and also a survey what you thought about this day and what we can improve on. Uh, but the assessment tool also in the afternoon here, we will have a, a workshop around that. So if you haven't signed up, you can actually uh, go in and, and on the same page where you got the links to this Zoom meeting, you can uh, go in and, and see those workshops, both on Lean AI transformation, where we'll deep dive into those different steps there, and also the assessment tool, which we really are big believers in. I think this will be very helpful for, for organizations and and. You know, if none of those links or, or things works for you, you can contact me directly and we'll have a discussion on this. Um, yes, and we have, um, we're not finished yet. We have the afternoon as well. So yes. it will be some some more hands-on workshops, but also seminars. Yes. And uh, what should you do if you haven't registered? You said it briefly, but here yes. it, we can also see the link. Exactly, right? you have the link there. And I think you might have received that the same link in, in an email. If not, then, you know, take a, screenshot or uh, do we paste it in the chat it, as well? Yeah, we pasted it in the chat and you can visit uh, AI.SC and, and look at the events. It's the AI Transformation Day. There you can find all of the links to the, uh, the workshops, uh, to the afternoon sessions. And uh, I, th this is a chance of, for both trying out the assessment tool and going through the Lean AI Transformation just in, in a very brief session. So, so really take the opportunity now to invest in even more competence and even more knowledge in this um, AI transformation field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that, I think we it's time to conclude. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for participating. And um, see you in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>